Hello and welcome to week two of our class. I'm excited uh, for you. You've made it through week one. Take a breath. Uh, you've got all the newness out of you if it's your first class uh, that you've returned to or, or maybe you've uh, just learning this system. Hopefully you've kind of worked through that and got accustomed to it. Uh, I appreciate all your emails and, and comments. Um, I am on this journey with you and we will continue to uh, learn together. Uh, this week, again, is week two, is theological foundations uh, specific to justification. Um, now, this week, I'm going to handle our lecture a little bit different. Uh, instead of just simply trying to review the material, I want to kind of hit a few highlights, and both to keep this lecture from being extremely lengthy, uh, but also, more importantly, what I feel, uh, to hopefully awaken some thought within you, to begin to take the text that we're reading and to begin to process it in a way that you can communicate and more importantly begin to engage your spirit and your mind and your heart to do uh, some action in, in the context that we're looking. So uh, that's, that's my ambition. So uh, you need to read the material, make notes, highlight, uh, come back to it because there is so much good material. Um, while both of them are dynamic, you could use Goss's book to teach from. Uh, for probably weeks and weeks uh, through a Bible study um, and understanding of salvation through the work of the Spirit. And, and so all of these are, are phenomenal. But I'm going to look at a few specific areas um, and try to uh, keep us focused in these areas of thought. When you look through uh, both books uh, specific to uh, Blevins and Maddox, there is this Wesleyan tradition of anthropology, anthropology, the study of uh, humanity, uh, of how we as human beings have behavior and what this looks like. And there's this distinguishing point of what Wesleyan tradition, Wesleyan theology uh, embraces in anthropology that really affects our mindset of discipleship. Um, he speaks that often other traditions, other um, denominations or theological backgrounds and traditions simply try to retrain the mind into different habits. To be good, for example, you need to do these things. Um, and, and this is a um, very negative approach they uh, speak of because it becomes difficult. You are trying to be trained to be like Christ. And while there's some elements of truth of, of this training or this educational component, it becomes hopeless in comparison as will never be good enough. And while we will never obviously be Christ, it is a very negative way. However, in a Wesleyan tradition uh, as we are, this understanding, as we talked about last week, this understanding of being formed in God's image really is powerful when we look at it in uh, this understanding of anthropology is not that simply we're bad and we're evil and we're nothing like God, but rather we've been formed in the image of God. Uh, really changes, verse, uh, changes our perspective. Uh, page 61 says, Wesleyans believe that one of the primary goals of salvation and particularly sanctification is the full, listen to this word, renewal of the image of God and the actualization or realization of Christ-likeness. I love that. Uh, how much more positive is it that we communicate that through the process and, and the uh, Walk, work of salvation and the continual walk in sanctification that God isn't retraining you and you're not just being rewired to think different. Rather, there is a renewal of the nature of God, the image of God that God made you in that's being awakened in you so that you will realize and you will see the Christ-like character God created you in his image to be. How much more positive is it to strive to be like Christ in that understanding than it is simply to be retrained? He formed you. He's already designed you in the image and the likeness of him. So therefore, walking holy and right before him is in your design, not a retraining. Uh, yes, there is a newness of our birth in Christ. And we understand that as we look through. But this understanding of being formed in the image of God uh, begins to help us live and walk in victory uh, and be victorious to overcome sin and to uh, walk as he has called us to walk, not simply because we're being retrained. And I like that uh, that opposite uh, or, or polar 
thoughts of whether we're being retrained or rather we're realizing the nature and the image we were created in. And I think that's important um, as we help people understand um, this process of sanctification as it speaks of in, in the writing in the textbooks, but the end goal of our discipleship process. Um, and so what it does is says we're not designed uh, to sin, we're designed to live holy. However, sin has affected our relationship, but it hasn't affected your design. You are still designed to be holy, to live as God has called you in his image. Sin's affected that, and it's separated you. It's created a distance in that relationship, but yet your design is still that. So as we understand that, as we uh, re embrace repentance and the restoration of this, uh, we see how important it is to understand the image of God. And so uh, that was, I think, theologically an important principle, but it comes extremely uh, important in the practical one-on-ones that you will have as you help encourage and walk with people in discipleship, but also in how we form uh, methods and models uh, in, in our local churches. Uh, Goss writes on page 29, um, there are substitutes for repentance, which are quite subtle and deceiving. Um, that the behavior, uh, that it is our behavior accepted to our society is not repentance. In this last sentence, to do by habit the things that are right requires no spiritual decision or commitment. And that's really the difference in this. As we see whether we're being retrained or reprogrammed versus we're awakening the image of God that's already there, the holiness of God that God created you in the likeness of Christ. Those two different says, one, we can train you to have habits that look like Christ but yet have not the reflection of Christ and certainly does not have the relationship with Christ. As we help people discover the restoration and relationship and the process of sanctification as being an awakening of the image of God, it changes how we do that because, again, quoting uh, Gauss, if we're not careful, simply retraining habits requires zero spiritual decision, commitment, and certainly because of that, does not mean there is true transformation. We do not have to look hard in our local churches and through our ministries of, of those we've encountered to see people learn the good habits and get rid of the bad habits but never truly experience transformation and never have a true spiritual decision or commitment. And so it's important to us that we have this understanding of what it is God's calling us into so that we can see people have spiritual decisions that create transformation, and through that, yes, the likeness of God becoming a reflection in their life. Um, and so I, I just felt that was very important to our practical nature um, of that. Now, the next piece of that, or it kind of ties well, is that this restoration into the image of God really revolves around the calling of a restoration of relationship through the love of God. Um, and, and I think, again, back to other traditions and sometimes maybe even in our own through creating this um, religious do and don't list, we've created not a, uh, a openness of an invitation in relationship with God, but rather a requirement to get to heaven, which becomes uh, cold, becomes dead, and what we produce is religious tradition but God's calling us through salvation and through repentance and the process of justification. He's calling to bring us in right relationship. And, and again, I do not have time to cover all of the, uh, the material that is given, but it is powerful as we help people begin to discover the call of relationship that he's uh, called us back into. And so for them that, this relationship is birthing not only uh, a restoration of the relationship, but a restoration of holiness and the image of God. And uh, quoting from another book of Maddox, in Maddox and Blevins' book, page 61, holiness then is expressed in love provides sin's cure. So we think of achieving holiness maybe in some of our tradition as the list of do this and don't do that, but rather it is the restoration of relationship in Christ that begins the work of the image of God, which again is holiness. This becomes the sin's cure, cure uh, in it. So 
here's, here's where the test becomes. Does our method that we practice and the ministry that we do uh, communicate the restoration of relationship or does it communicate the change of habits? If our discipleship does not speak and does not clearly call people into restoration of relationships, uh, specific the relationship with God through the image that he's created in his likeness to walk coldly, and we simply are trying to retrain people, then we probably do not have a good uh, theology and definitely not a good practice of our theology in our ministry. Uh, this, um, this call of restoration of relationship is transformational to those that will go through it because, again, it requires a spiritual commitment and it is spiritually transforming. Um, as we become transformed by the instant and the continual relationship we're being called back to, our habits will change and our actions will become more Christ-like, but it begins in the call back to a transformal relationship with the Lord uh, through that. So uh, what is our model? What is our methods, our methodology speak to about our returning to pe or returning people into relationship back to God in his love? Um, and so with that in mind, let's look at Wesley's model. Uh, Wesley was formed uh, with a, a theology that was deep, that um, was important, but and, and we've covered some of that and we will continue but I want you to note, I'm going to pull out from some of the text uh, a specific example, and I want you to see how Wesley's model um, was not a random model, definitely was not cultural, it de uh, cultural in the church world. It was definitely um, not just reactive to needs of the community, but rather his model and method was formed out of his own theology, uh, his belief in, in the work of the Lord, and specific to the call of this transformational life in Christian education. And so simply he had more than just a theology. He had a model that was based through his uh, theology and his theology empowered his practice. And so let's look at uh, this. You'll see this uh, beginning in, I believe, page 39, but, but you'll see this uh, phrase that's used several times. It's a core part of Wesley's uh, theology, this holiness of heart and life, uh, meaning the holiness of heart, the spiritual person, but also the activity and so we see some of the social justice, uh, social reform elements because of this play out, but, but that's a broader context I'm cover. Page 39, it says, The primary theological focus and singular emphasis of Wesley's educational perspective remains holiness of heart in life. This was the transformation that he was preaching, and it's foundational to the activity. Uh, so his educational model Resi uh, existed in three core areas that I want to mention. Um, and that was where he speaks of salvation, discipleship, and service. Uh, other phrases are used, but this idea of the whole person and the whole spiritual person became something that he not only believed, but he actually found methods to help uh, achieve that. And so we see as you follow that and even read further into Wesley's um, practice how there's kind of an evolution or there's adaptions based off discerning of what the was being met in the current practice and also culturally what was happening in his context but we see the emergence of three core things and I want you to see how each of them had a unique place to match the theology uh, uh, that he was practicing or trying to help uh, disciple people in one uh, was the groups or bands uh, as he called them choirs and classes was a second and then societies was kind of the third. Let's start at the last one. Now, there's not a lot mentioned in the material, but if you look beyond, um, and I'm oversimplifying, but societies were what we would probably today call a church service. They are often consisted of some singing element. There was a teaching, preaching element often, but it was more importantly the larger gathering that took place of those. It started as, as he started back in his early time in kind of these clubs, uh, is, is the phrase that was used, but they grew into societies and there were societies in different areas. Uh, he ended up traveling to each of those areas and establishing leadership, etc. And so again, this was the larger gathering because it had a place, but there was also this need uh, in the Blevins and Maddox points out it really derives from his own family uh, where he saw his parents having these small intimate gatherings where they shared with one another and the value of that. And so he instilled 
these band meetings that uh, were primarily relational. Now, uh, they had a couple of functions and times, but specific, there was uh, what became the primary, it seems, uh, one called an edification group. And I think this is interesting as we look at how we traditionally think of discipleship and, and the teaching component so often we put in place. But the core of bands or, or these small group gatherings was relational and sharing prayers for one another um, and where content of the Bible, so to speak, was not the core. Edification groups, page 74 says, were called bands and they were for personal encouragement. Notice this, no teaching was allowed during those meetings, only intimate sharing, confession, and personal reporting of spiritual experiences. Now, how odd is that in many of our tradition of getting together in any form of groups? Uh, we almost think it's a um, unholy to not share or preach or teach or at least do a devotion. I remember early days pastoring that uh, we would do something. Maybe it was a social gathering or, or especially if we went out and did uh, maybe a service project to go out and serve our community in some capacity. I remember a number of times being asked, hey, pastor, do you want to prepare a, a, a Bible verse to share or a devotion? And, and I remember often feeling just to say no. And that seems so counterproductive to how we are wired in our tradition. But I, I've said no on that numbers of times to now it's quite constant. Is It's okay to just have a relationship and to gather in that and to pray for one another and support one another. Uh, because it's it's so ingrained in us that it's content driven, but Wesley understood that from his family dynamic that there was a relationship component that was so needed. And I, I would say that if you look to a positive of our American culture, specific to the American church, and you look at uh, maybe the emerging churches and and even some contemporary churches of their time that, that really this small group model is, is really a part. And uh, several of those churches state that uh, they are not a church uh, made up of small groups, but rather, or excuse me, a church that has small groups, but rather they are a church that's made up of small groups. And the point is the emphasis on the small group. Um, there's a lot of small group models and, and things, but Wesley is attributed in part to being this small group father because he understood this, but the point I want to make is not the numeric size, why they were very small, but I want us, and particularly in our tradition, these bands, as we've had traditionally, were not content-driven. They were relationally driven. Um, in today's world, more than ever, we have uh, an, an insane, insane amount of content that's at our finger, uh, finger touches from our cell phones, to modes of, of the internet, uh, through YouTube as this is, uh, we have opportunity to get all the content we want. And we have social activity through social media, but really what's missing in both of those is a true relational interaction. Where, you know, and notice that as he defines these relational meetings, it was an intimate sharing, confession. Now, this doesn't mean that there, in my opinion, that you came in and listed out your sins, but rather when you have intimate relationship, there is trust to have confession. Uh, there should be such closeness in those intimate gatherings that you could. Uh, I could share in length a story, but simply in my early uh, days of um, ministry and, and maybe my late teen years, I was a part of a group that was really a prayer group, but I'll never forget a day when a uh, young married man came in requesting prayer for temptations he was dealing with in life that were not uh, fitting into our tradition of what a godly man, particularly a member of a prayer team, would feel tempted. But his honesty and his trust in that group became something that was uh, wonderful for him and the whole group because there was trustworthy. So he was confessing not necessarily a sin in that moment, but a struggle. And it actually helped him and it bound that group closer together. But there was trust there. Um, you can't force confession, but rather trust builds an opportunity for confession. Um, and so because of that, they shared in what we would call testimonies uh, in that. So I want you to see the beauty of that. It's not that because it lacked a biblical teaching that it did not have a biblical or spiritual context. It did. 
but relationship was the driving factor. Um, I, I may share at a later time of some of my observations of groups and, and other activities and traditions, but I think some of these as you evaluate our tradition historically and not just our movement, but the North American church, that you will see oftentimes we've removed the relational component in favor of content and activity and we've actually saw a loss of health of the whole group, but more importantly, as we look into our class, we actually lose the, the heart of discipleship, which is raising people um, to be like Christ. And so uh, you see all of these uh, interactions of how he had the whole person cover, mind, body, spirit, we often say, or I say, but this holistic, whole person approach, he saw a need of teaching. So he created classes because they were a gap. He felt like between the relational, he felt like the service had an aspect, but they needed teaching. And so he created classes as um, we saw at times they were called these choirs, but they were larger, more specialized in teaching. And so he covered all of these areas based off of the theology and he discerned the context and culture and he created a model that met all of the spiritual needs of uh, Christian education or discipleship for that time and what it did it fulfilled what he felt uh, and what he wrote a lot about is this uh, again this holiness of heart and life to make the whole person it so I think that is important to see how that practice uh, or excuse me his practice was birthed out of his theology um, and I encourage us to do the same in fact I'll ask you what is it that your theology is birthing in practice um, that you would do to look into your context and your culture uh, we learn from our history. We, we don't just throw it out for the sake of throwing it out. We learn from it, but oftentimes we find um, that as, as, as something that was birthed in spirit, was birthed in vision, as we process it and program it, uh, what happens is we end up losing the heart of it and we just have a program which lacks relationship and lacks passion. And so what is it as God's rebirthing in your church, in your ministry, through the theology, the conviction of the word and, and this awakening of these principles of foundational discipleship that God's stirring in you. Now, I, I believe it's probably just beginning. Uh, maybe it's something that's been there, some uneasiness in your heart and in your mind that God is trying to awaken and challenge us to break from just doing the same thing because we've always done it, but allow him to bring about something new. Uh, and bring this holistic. There's a book that was recently in the last few years written by Francis Chan. It's not per se an academic book, but it is a great uh, kind of devotional read uh, called Letters to the Church. And in this, uh, he, he presents a question is really the framework of the reason he wrote the book. And it's this, what if you removed everything you know about church other than what you've read in the New Testament and specific to the book of Acts? What a challenging question that is. Well, what is he saying? He is, to our context of our conversation, he's saying if you only had the word to frame what you would do for discipleship and look into your context and your culture, what would you do? Not because it's always been done, but what would you do in that? And so this is what we see Wesley do a lot uh, because a lot of what he did was kind of different. Um, there were some aspects he took with him, but there was differences that he took. There was a reformational kind of context. Why? Because... He was letting his theology drive his method. Uh, and if there's ever been a time in the American church that we need an awakening and, dare I say, a revival of discipleship, it is now. Um, through the recording of this and those that are in this class, um, our history in the last 12 months has been challenged of how we practice so much of what we do as church, our tradition. But the theology, the belief of discipleship in Christian education the heart of that through the Word of God has not changed, but our methods and our models may have to adapt. And if we'll let that, that deep-rooted theology of the Word as well as the conviction of uh, what God is doing in discipleship, I believe God's going to birth some new things. And I want to encourage you with that. Let the conviction that God has placed in you through the reading awaken new models, new modes of doing things. Again, not to just forsake tradition or what's worked for the sake of change, but rather that God would bring on it something new. I think I mentioned previously a former minister, uh, elder that was in my life who made a statement. If I didn't, let me say it this way. Oftentimes God does not 
just get rid of the old, but rather he shows us a new way. The illustration he gave was as if painting it uh, fresh, cleaning it and putting a fresh coat of paint. Sometimes our activity just needs an awakening, and usually that awakening is uh, reigniting the reason or the purpose that we have begun that through these convictions of theology. And so I want to encourage you uh, in that. Let the Lord lead you. There may be some completely new things you do. Um, and I, I uh, could tell of my stories as well as I'm certain that you could tell of yours. Uh, but the, some of the greatest moments have been when the Lord just called a need and we were able to minister to that, uh, to that person and to that group of people not because our tradition had done it that way, but because that was the need and that the Lord showed us through discerning and through our, our, our beliefs and discipleship of what God was doing uh, to the relationship, to their uh, teaching needs, etc. And so uh, I encourage you. Um, we often try to do everything Wesley did in his three modes in one or two hours of a Sunday morning service. Um, and so it's not a number or number of times we meet, but rather it's this focus in the needs that we have. And so, uh, again, just encourage you um, to allow the Holy Spirit to help reshape uh, and use this. That's the goal. Um, I hope that we're not simply being affirmed in what we're already doing. Um, I know in the model that I believe the Lord has given me that we're trying to practice uh, I am looking through those lenses at our text and looking back at our modes and seeing, God, how do I reshape? So I ask you to join me in that. God, reshape us and how we can help bring about a transformational process of discipleship and those that we're leading and ministering to. Um, so I hope that's been helpful or at least thought-provoking for you. Uh, if you have questions, please, again, email me uh, if you I have an emergency, uh, let me know uh, that as well. Um, I will be uh, making a few uh, probably posts uh, just uh, as I find out some information. I understand some of you may have uh, had issues, again, with um, discussion posts, and I, I will share some updates on that once I get with the uh, admin of the system. Uh, we'll be doing that. Remember this week, your discussion questions, as it was last week, is I'm asking you not to answer every question, but choose two and engage with them. I want you to interact. Do not just recite the reading or myself, but rather what was your agreement, your disagreement? What is it from that you're bringing out of it and process it? That's that's so much of the heart of what this mode of, of um, education is, is you, you receive information, but how you process it, uh, hearing it, listening to it, being adapted, changed by it, and then how are you responding to it? Um, and so... I uh, encourage you to do that. Uh, share your agreements and disagreements with the text or with one another, but always do it respectfully and in love. Again, if I can help you in any way, please email me. And um, I look forward to reading your post in your papers uh, this week. And um, I will have grades posted in the next few days. God bless you. And if I can help you, let me know.